Chris Cowdley. Uh, Chris, uh, as you may know, is from Seattle. He's the director of the Liver Institute Northwest, which he formed himself after leaving Swedish Hospital. And uh, he is the, also the professor of uh, medicine at the Ellison Floyd College of Medicine, Washington State University. Chris is well known to all for a number of topics, but he's going to speak today on PBC and PSC. So, Chris, <laughs> welcome. Thank you, Paul. It's an honor to be included in this uh, conference. It's always my favorite, uh, both for content and location of any conference in the US. So um, I'm really pleased also to be able to see familiar faces in the audience and to be able to actually shake hands. Um, so my goal is to uh, review PBC and PSC abstracts from the liver meeting. <clears throat> Here are my disclosures. These are the main uh, abstracts that I'm going to cover, the main topics. Um, there was a late breaker about a long-term obeticolic acid therapy um, from the uh, open label POISE um, long-term safety extension cohort. And uh, it's particularly useful to look at this in the context of how do we, um, how do we deal with a chronic disease that is slowly progressive um, and uh, has achieved uh, approval using the subpart H pathway on a surrogate endpoint uh, and needs validation for traditional approval uh, using a hard endpoint uh, confirmatory study. And options include a actual clinical trial and uh, uh, these trials are increasingly difficult to enroll in, especially if you have a therapy that's already available that patients may want to take. Um, and furthermore, given that these are rare diseases, how do we even find enough patients to achieve the statistical power to show our effect size? Um, so the concept here was to see whether we can use historical controls as a way of trying to get at this problem. I'm going to get into that a little bit because I think it's quite interesting uh, and may hold important um, sort of template for future development of other rare diseases. I'm going to review data with cell at Delpar, which is a PPAR delta agonist <clears throat> and is currently in a phase three clinical trial for PBC. And this is a two-year um, treatment study uh, in the, uh, of an extension of the phase two trial. I will talk a little bit about predictors of decompensation uh, with obeticolic acid. As you know, uh, obeticolic acid underwent a label change in May of this year where <clears throat> treatment is restricted to patients uh, with cirrhosis uh, without, uh, only if they lack portal hypertension uh, and patients with decompensated cirrhosis uh, should not be treated. This label has not changed in Europe, by the way, and other parts of the world. Um, there is a very interesting abstract from, um, uh, from the Stanford group led by Ray Kim about weightless mortality for PBC in the OCA era. I'm going to present some data on uh, HT1801, which is a novel compound of urso with berberine um, as a treatment for PSC, and then finish by talking about cholangiocarcinoma risk in PSC from a population-based cohort uh, in um, Scandinavia that is generating a lot of uh, discussion. So PBC, as you know, is a rare autoimmune uh, chronic disease affecting the bile ducts. It affects one in a thousand women over age 40. Urso is a first-line therapy, and we have a need for effective second-line therapy for the 60 percent of patients uh, who, um, for the 40 to 50 percent of patients who may not respond or may not tolerate Urso. So uh, we've known for quite some time now from work that was done by the Global PBC Study Group, which I've had the privilege of being part of for many years, that alkaline phosphatase is an important distinction, is a distinctor uh, in terms of separating patients in terms of long-term outcome. Now this is important because historically we use the MELD uh, score 
to identify patients with PBC who had high risk of adverse outcomes. But the MEL score was really intended to identify patients who needed a liver transplant within the next five years. Uh, we see patients with PBC now much younger and also at much earlier stages of the disease, so they're expected to have a much longer period of survival before they need transplant or may experience liver-related death. So we need other surrogate endpoints that give us a longer time frame, and alkaline phosphatase was one of that. This study showed that alkaline phosphatase greater than versus less than two times upper limit of normal one year after starting ERSO really shows a difference in transplant-free survival, and alkaline phosphatase predicted liver transplantation and liver-related death. So based on this, obeticolic acid was approved using a, a subpart H pathway as a surrogate endpoint. So this um, approval was based on a trial called the POIS trial, where patients who were responders were those who, after a year of orsotherapy, achieved an alkaline phosphatase less than 1.67 times upper limit of normal with at least a 15% reduction and maintained a normal bilirubin. The open label study went on for five years plus. Patients who were on placebo crossed over to OCA treatment. They were then followed for up to additional five years. A few had even longer follow-up, and the events, me events measured include death and liver transplant. So here's the double-blind period, and here's the open-label period where patients started at five and could titrate up to 10. So the purpose of this abstract was to compare clinical outcomes of patients treated in this long-term open-label safety extension to two external control groups that are patient registries. So you have the treated arm, the POIS double-blind trial arm, 59 sites in 13 countries, 209 OCA-treated patients, and two external control cohorts, the PBC registry from the Global PBC Study Group, over 5,000 patients from 17 EU and North American centers, and we uh, were part of this. UK PBC, which is 161 centers, uh, and many more from secondary referrals with almost 7,000 uh, OCA-naive patients. So this is how the process went. There was a, the external control patients were required to meet inclusion exclusion criteria of the POI study. And so they reviewed the data, identified adult patients who were treated or untreated with ERSO with a diagnosis of PSC, PBC, identified those that would have been eligible for, for the POI study, identified patients with one or more visits that fulfilled inclusion exclusion criteria, and then came up with 1,390 and 2,130 patients respectively with a total of about 15,000 visits. Patients who were followed for less than a year if treated with ERSO were excluded, those diagnosed prior to 1990, and those with already known complications of liver disease and ALT more than 10 times upper limit of normal. The next step was to balance the key covariates. So here are the covariates, sex, age, duration of disease, ERSO use, alkaline phosphatase, bilirubin, ALP, uh, ALP bilirubin, factor, AST, and a logistic regression analysis was conducted to obtain these propensity scores, which, uh, which determined the probability of treatment given the set of covariates. And then inverse probability of treatment weights was calculated for each patient using these propensity scores. UKPBC had very similar um, different uh, criteria, except for ALT, which was not collected in the global PBC study group. So here's the population. They were pretty reasonably matched. So here's POIS, Global, and UK. Uh, vast majority were women. Slightly higher proportion treated with ERSO in the UK P PBC study group. Years of diagnosis more or less comparable. Age was slightly older in the UK PBC. Alkaline phosphatase uh, times upper limit of normal similar. Bilirubin similar. And AST also similar with about 17% in POIS and 14% in global having cirrhosis at inclusion. So what this slide shows is that the population that we are comparing the POIS cohort to was well balanced after waiting, and you see that almost all the variables in the global PBC study group fell within this range uh, that was comparable to POIS. So the standardized variable differences were fairly small and almost fell along this central line. Similarly, although less uh, nicely with POIS uh, versus UK PBC, there were a few things that were outside, namely ALT, but otherwise, again, both groups were fairly well matched after waiting. <clears throat> 
And here's the result. So you can see that when you compare the POISE data to the external control, in this case, Global PBC and UK PBC study group, there was a significantly lower rate of transplant or liver-related death with three deaths in POISE compared to much higher numbers, although which much greater numbers uh, for the denominator in Global PBC and UK PBC. So this provides a really interesting way of comparing survival with a treated group compared to a historical control group. And obericholic acid was associated with a lower risk for liver-related liver related death or liver transplant um, in, um, in comparison to both global and UK PBC uh, with hazard ratios that were really quite reasonable uh, and in fact quite impressive when you look at univariate, multivariable, or weighted COX ratios. Uh, and the weighted COX was about 0.28 for hazard ratio, so about a 72% risk reduction in the group treated with OCA compared to this historical control group. So these data, I think, uh, hopefully will provide useful information, but also may help from a regulatory standpoint to see if we can use external controls as a possible way of allowing for traditional or regular approval uh, for rare diseases with long natural history. The next abstract is the idea of early identification of insufficient biochemical response with urso treatment in patients with PBC. So currently, it's recommended that we evaluate patients one year after they've been placed on urso to determine whether they're a candidate for OCA or for a clinical trial. And the uh, background here is, um, uh, is, is that this one year period may be too long. So the goal here was to assess the pattern of biochemical response in PBC patients after ERSO initiation and determine the utility of alkaline phosphatase at six months as a predictor of insufficient response. So the cohort was identified from global PBC study group. They were ERSO treated, had at least six months of follow-up, and were excluded if they died in the first year. Biochemical response was the POISE criteria, that is achieving an alkaline phosphatase less than 1.67 times upper limit of normal with a normal total bilirubin. And they used statistics uh, using Kaplan-Meier as well as various thresholds of ALP at six months to predict uh, insufficient response uh, from a negative predictive value point of view. So what they concluded was the serum alkaline phosphatase after six months of ERSO initiation demonstrates utility in identifying insufficient response to the POISE criteria within one to two years. So they proposed a cutoff value of 2.5 times upper limit of normal at six months for adding second line therapy. And the summary of the findings here are that there are patients that respond to therapy beyond one year, so some may respond if you continue past a year, but for those patients whose serum alkaline phosphatase after six months of ERSO remains greater than 1.9 and definitely greater than 2.5 times upper limit of normal, uh, they sh should be appropriately considered for second line therapy because their likelihood of achieving that 1.67 times upper limit of normal at one year is much lower. So you don't need to wait a full year. And I think many of you in clinical practice probably already doing this. Next, moving on to Celadelpar. So Celadelpar is part of the PPAR agonists that are now being used to treat liver disease. Uh, <clears throat> as you know, we have pan-PPAR, such as bezofibrate and phenofibrate. We have um, PPAR, um, uh, PPAR gamma, which is pioglitazone, uh, and there are other PPAR gammas that are being developed. Uh, and there's elafibrinor, which is a PPAR alpha-delta dual agonist, and Celadelpar is a pure PPAR delta agonist. Uh, and these agents uh, have a variety of favorable effects from an inflammatory and choleritic, choleratic point of view. So they, uh, Celadelpar reduces cholesterol synthesis and absorption, reduces bile acid synthesis, and increases bile acid transport. Uh, appears to have a, a good signal with regard to antifibrotic properties by reducing expression of profibrotic genes, reducing stellate cell activation and collagen synthesis, anti-inflammatory activities, and improved lipid metabolism. So Celadelpar was previously studied in phase two trials and in fact was in an in a <clears throat> abbreviated phase three trial that was stopped and then it's now started again. Uh, in uh, PBC. So the phase two open label um, study was completed and then there's a long-term extension study. 
the entry criteria were similar to what we see now, except ALT and AST needed to be three times, less than three times upper limit of normal, bilirubin less than two. Doses used were five or 10 milligrams daily. Primary efficacy endpoint was change in ALP, and secondary was uh, the POIS criteria, less than 1.67, greater than 15% decrease, and normal bilirubin. But they also looked at some other things, such as ALP normalization, uh, which is something we almost never see with obeticholic acid. So here's the study population. Once again, very similar to the PBC patients we see. Age, <clears throat> mean 57, 93% AMA positive, most with at least 10 years of disease, and biochemistries that were consistent with PBC uh, and synthetic function normal. So 103 patients were enrolled. 96 patients were on treatment, uh, and evaluable patients include 102 at one year and 53 at two years. So here are the data. The alkaline phosphatase change uh, shows a nice reduction uh, that starts really uh, pretty quickly after starting and uh, hits, a, um, hits a more plateau between three to 12 months. At 12 months, you see about a 42 and a 44% reduction um, in all patients and in completers and 50% reduction in alkaline phosphatase at two years. And then when you look at the two-year completer population, the alkaline phosphatase is about 143 at two years. So that is less than 1.5 times upper limit of normal, and really a very impressive reduction in alkaline phosphatase uh, when you compare it to other options. Now when you look at the composite endpoint, or the so-called POIS endpoint, what percentage achieved an alkaline phosphatase less than 1.67 times upper limit normal, at least a 15% reduction, and a bilirubin normal? It was 64% at one year, and in the completer population, 67 and 79% at two years. Most impressively, when you look at the completers, 42% of the patients at two years achieved a normal alkaline phosphatase, uh, which is quite remarkable, uh, compared to 27% at one year and 24% in the intent-to-treat population. Adverse events are shown on this slide based on the safety population, uh, and there are really no surprises here, uh, no liver-related serious adverse events or treatment-related serious adverse events. Um, the side effects that were reported in more than 15% of patients were nausea, fatigue, and other some nonspecific symptoms. Uh, and interestingly, 25% of patients reported pruritus, which uh, is relatively low for this population where frequently 50 to 60% will report pruritus at baseline. So the conclusion of this long-term open-label study was that Celadelpar appears safe and well-tolerated leads to reductions in bi biomarkers of cholestasis and hepatocellular injury, which continue to improve with second year of treatment. Nearly eight out of 10 achieved the composite endpoints and over 40% normalized alkaline phosphatase. Uh, and as you know, there's a phase three global study currently enrolling uh, these patients. I'm gonna move on and talk about a proof of concept study with uh, HD 1801, uh, which is a very interesting compound. It's uh, berberine, which is available. Uh, you can buy it online. It's a Chinese herb, and it's approved for tra traveler's diarrhea in some countries in Asia. And this uh, compound has a lot of very interesting properties that include anti-inflammatory, appears to have insulin sensitizing properties, uh, appears to improve the metabolic profile, etc. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was a paper in Nature Communications with this compound in NASH showing significant reduction in hemoglobin A1C and et cetera, and trials in NASH are ongoing. Uh, this study was in patients with PSC who had previously not been exposed to ERSO. So um, as you know, PSC is an inflammatory cholestatic liver disease uh, that affects the bile ducts, no effective treatment. So. HD1801 is an ionic salt of berberine and ursodeoxycholic acid uh, with anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, and anticholestatic and antifibrotic effects, we think and hope. And the preliminary results that we conducted showed a significant reduction in alkaline phosphatase with two doses. Um, but the changes in serum markers of cholestasis and liver injury were very different in patients who previously were treated with urso compared to those who had not. And of course, that's because you have urso and then you put the patient on another compound that contains urso that makes it a little bit muddied. 
So the goal here was to assess changes in alkaline phosphatase and other markers of PSC related to treatment in patients who had not previously received ERSO. So here's the study design, 55 patients randomized and treated. A uh, little over half were not treated with prior ERSO. There were two doses, 500 milligrams BID and 1,000 BID. And the molar ratios are relatively 50-50, so you can assume roughly that half of the dose was ERSO and the other half was berberine. And then the patient's primary endpoint was change in alkaline phosphatase, and then there's a extension and randomized withdrawal phase. Primary focus was the effects observed during this first period uh, in subjects who were not previously treated and were included in the ITT population. So entry criteria were alkaline phosphatase greater than 1.5 times upper limit of normal. Patients with small duct PSC overlap syndrome with autoimmune or PBC were excluded. And here's the baseline demographics of the 32 subjects. <clears throat> Pretty typical for a PSC population. <clears throat> History of IBD was slightly different in the, in the three groups, but in the treated groups, consistent with what we normally see. High alkaline phosphatase and gamma GT, a moderate elevation of aminotransferases, and bilirubin close to normal. And here's what you see, the substantial and rapid reduction in alkaline phosphatase uh, at uh, both doses compared to placebo. And when you look at mean alkaline phosphatase, you can see that by two weeks, you're starting to see a reduction. Uh, and when you look at change from baseline uh, in terms of absolute units, uh, about 150 to 130 point reduction, which ends at about 125 and 141 point reduction in alkaline phosphatase. These are in people who are not previously treated with ERSO. And a greater percentage of subjects receiving HCD-1801 then placebo achieved this key threshold that was arbitrarily defined. What percentage achieved 25% reduction, 50% reduction, achieved an alkaline phosphatase less than one and a half versus normalization. And 14% normalized in the higher dose group, 43% got to less than 1.5, and 29% got to 50% reduction, and 71% and 56% respectively got to a 25% reduction. So in summary, a greater percentage of subjects receiving uh, HCD-1801 uh, at 1,000 BID versus 500 BID achieved these key alkaline phosphatase threshold, and no placebo patients achieved these thresholds. And there was a dose-dependent improvement in other biomarkers, such as AST, ALT, and gamma-GT, and you can see that uh, it appears to be higher uh, in all these three categories with the higher dose compared to the lower dose and no real movement with placebo. Bilirubin remained stable and generally in the normal range through the first period. You can see here bilirubin essentially uh, more or less uh, normal without a significant change uh, in this population. And here are the treatment emergent adverse events. We generally expect um, some sort of GI uh, type of side effect, uh, just knowing uh, the properties of berberin. Uh, interestingly, we didn't see much in the way of those side effects in the low dose group, but in the higher dose group, 33% uh, reported diarrhea, 20% nausea, 13% vomiting, 13% oropharyngeal pain, uh, and no dose-related effect on pruritus uh, was observed. Uh, one serious adverse event and one adverse event leading to discontinuation, and these were related to C. diff colitis, uh, and one patient randomized to placebo withdrew consent. So in summary, in subjects with PSC and no prior exposure to UDCA, 1801 over six weeks results in substantial reduction in alkaline phosphatase, achieving key thresholds that were arbitrarily defined, no real change in placebo, and dose-dependent reduction in STLT and GGT, and bilirubin maintained in the normal range, and treatment emergence adverse events uh, did occur in the higher dose group, but did not result in related discontinuation. Moving on, um, this was an interesting study of predictions of liver failure in patients with cirrhosis and PBC who were treated with OCA. Now, obviously, since OCA has had a label change, and there is now a direction that patients with uh, portal hypertension, such as platelets less than 120,000, esophageal varices, should not be treated. Uh, it's important to understand there are patients who are already on treatment and what are the f f characteristics that might lead them to develop decompensation. <clears throat> so in this particular study, 100 patients with PBC and cirrhosis were included in this analysis. The vast majority had child PU class A. 
31, per, 31 patients had varices and five had ascites at baseline. According to the POISE criteria, 33 and 32% respectively achieved a biochemical response at six and 12 months. Um, and 35% and 41% in the TCC population. This is the overall cohort and completer population. And when you look at what were the factors that were associated with non-response to abeticolic acid, uh, male sex, INR 1.37, child pew score, and MEL score, and total bilirubin independently associated with non-response. So what this tells us is, first of all, patients with more advanced disease not only are at greater risk for worsening, but also less likely to respond, whereas, conversely, a substantial percentage of patients who may already have cirrhosis who are on treatment about 30% to 33% may actually continue to benefit or possibly benefit from being on OCA. Um, and so uh, categorically, we should probably, my opinion is that we should probably not stop therapy in patients who have cirrhosis who are already on it, and maybe look at these risk factors uh, for lack of response to decide who may not benefit from continued treatment. Uh, this was a very interesting uh, study that looked at waitlist mortality of decompensated PBC patients in the OCA era. And uh, the goal here was to look at observed versus expected survival from baseline for up to 90 days in the pre-OCA validation cohort and the OCA cohort. So you have observed debts and expected debts, and you have cumulated number of debts in a cohort that was pre-OCA validation and then after a group of individuals who were included in the OCA cohort. And it does appear that after the introduction of OCA, there appears to be a lower likelihood of weightless mortality in patients with PBC with decompensated liver disease. So the conclusion was that um, more weight does need to be given to bilirubin for better mortality prediction. And of course, we all know this from those of us that do transplant medicine, that patients with cholestatic liver diseases in general, and PBC in particular, are disadvantaged with the MELD score because the bilirubin has to do all the heavy lifting for these patients. And um, an argument can be made that uh, bilirubin should be weighted differently for these patients. The other conclusion was that based on the model, the risk of death among patients with decompensated PBC in the OCA era is lower than expected. So does this mean that more patients are being treated with OCA and therefore reducing the need for liver transplantation and therefore weightless mortality? Or is it some other factor? It's not clear. Uh, certainly we'll look for the full paper to um, identify the details. And finally, this, this uh, poster generated a lot of controversy and discussion. Um, and this was, and it was also selected as one of the best of ASLD um, uh, abstracts. And this is a prospective surveillance uh, with PSC for early detection of cholangiocarcinoma. So of course, all of us who care, take care of PSC patients struggle with how do we do cancer surveillance, particularly for cholangiocarcinoma? Um, do, how do we do that for patients with cirrhosis versus those without cirrhosis? Um, everybody has their own different uh, pattern of, uh, of of a surveillance, and this is all informed from the original Mayo data suggesting that cholangiocarcinoma risk was about 30% in patients with PSC. And many of us have felt that that probably represents selection bias, uh, cohort bias, and ascertainment bias, uh, and early diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma in high-risk patients who were referred to Mayo. More recent data suggests the risk may be much lower. So the goal here was to prospectively evaluate cholangiocarcinoma surveillance with yearly MRI, MRCP, and nationwide cohort study. So this eliminates some of the bias concerns. They did prospective five-year surveillance study with yearly MRI, MRCP, clinical evaluation, and liver function tests in PSC patients, and those with worrisome features were further investigated. And here are the main findings. The incidence of cholangiocarcinoma was only 2%, very low. 24% developed worrisome features, but only 10% had underlying malignancy. But the median survival for patients, even with this approach, was 13 months, with a range of three to 22 months. And you can see here on the graph shown here, low cumulative incidence, survival not very good, transplant-free survival overall not too bad, but the survival for hepatobiliary malignancy 
and survival from diagnosis still somewhat disappointing. So these authors concluded MRI, MRCP surveillance followed by standard investigation did not detect cancer early enough to really provide long-term survival, and this together with a very low occurrence of cholangio uh, questioned the value of yearly surveillance in all PSC patients. And some of the commentaries around this um, in various, uh, you know, um, in various uh, areas were, does this discourage people from doing surveillance? Will we be doing a disservice to patients in the future? What do these data really mean? I'll uh, be interested to hear comments from the audience. Thank you very much.